Welcome back. <clears throat> if you can see my heart right now, it's like beating out of my chest. I, uh, when I think about the last year and a half and where God's brought us. And, um, you know, this time last year, <clears throat> you know, we were all home. Uh, I got, I'm a church planter. My wife and I moved to Columbus 11 years ago, did a year of pre-launch and, you know, things shut down and we didn't know what was going to happen. People are always real nice. Oh, we love the church pastor. We're so thankful for this church, but you just don't know when things shut down and 30 million people out of work and you can't meet anymore and out of sight, out of mind. Are people really going to fight for the work that the Lord's doing? Are they going to stick around? Are they going to have your back? Are you going to... How's it going to go? You know, it's been a tough year and a tough year to stay united and to keep our eyes on the most important things. And you guys have fought for the church. You fought for the mission of God. You fought to stay unified. And I'm just proud of this church. I'm thankful to be among you, thankful to be a part of this and to have lived through a really tough time and, and to just be ready for what God has next. You, you guys have been so gracious to me and to us. Um, I, can, I can promise you in Bible school, which is a real thing, Bible school, uh, they don't have any pandemic training. <laughs> There's none. There's no like, you know, day one of the pandemic, here's what you're going to want to do. Everybody get your pad out. Uh, day two, make sure you do this. Don't forget about this. I mean, we, we were flying without a net. We didn't know what we were doing. And yet you guys have been so kind so gracious and, and you've come together and uh, I, I don't know that I've been able to say thank you enough, uh, but I'm so grateful and uh, today's an awesome day. And, uh, God, and we're not out of the woods, we're still moving forward, but God has sustained and he's building something. Uh, I wanna talk to you today about victory. We're, we're gonna begin this conversation, we're gonna carry it through the month of April into May. And uh, we're going to talk about what it really means to live in victory, to walk in victory, to have a victory. You know, if you hang around church, you hear a lot about victory, a lot of songs about victory. We got anybody who's been around church for a little bit, remember the song, Victory in Jesus? Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. No auto-tune, you guys can't help your boy out. <clears throat> um, Victory in Jesus, you know, we have new versions of that. I'm going to see a victory because the battle belongs to the Lord. And you are the champion. Giants fall when you stand. And you can do all things but fail. You've never lost a battle. Okay, we sing a lot of victory. And, and yet you may show up when we're singing about victory and it may feel like nails on a chalkboard to you because you're like, everything in my life feels like a loss. I don't feel like I'm living in victory. Uh, you're talking about victory, Pastor. I appreciate your optimism. I appreciate your heart, but I buried somebody I love this year, somebody I love with all my heart. Or maybe you buried a business this year, something you put your heart and soul into. It meant something to you. Your blood, sweat, and tears seemed to be in vain, and you lost it. Or maybe you say, you know, my, my relationships have imploded. I've never been lonelier than I am right now, so I don't know what this undefeated stuff is all about. Maybe you're dealing with a, a, a habit you can't quite kick. You keep trying to get victory over it and it feels like more loss than win. You get a little bit of win here and there, but for the most part, it's one loss after another. You're getting your teeth kicked in. And so you're talking about what, what is victory? What, what is this victory we're singing about? We have to have an honest conversation about this. Otherwise, it's just superstition and we're not about that life. We're, we're gonna look at what it really means to walk in victory. We're gonna start the conversation today. Uh, we're we're going, going to uh, start in Hebrews 12, one and two. Uh, that says, let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. I want to pause there for a moment because what the writer of Hebrews does is he brings an intersection between the race you run and the race I run and the race Jesus ran. And so he, he uses the metaphor of a race and he says, you got you to learn how to endure, okay? He could have used a battle or a fight or a war, but he uses a race and he says, we, we have to run with endurance and he makes the point that uh, he goes on to say that not only do we need to run our race with endurance, but here's how we do it, verse 2, by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. As we talk about Jesus, when you read about Jesus, you learn about Jesus, it's important to keep top of mind that Jesus was fully God and fully man. It's important that we don't deify him to the point that we forget about his humanity, 
because Jesus was a human being. And so he was tempted in all points as we are. He dealt with the things we feel. In fact, I want to take you right up to sort of the calm before the storm, right before Jesus uh, begins his last few hours on the earth and, and, and t- makes his journey to the cross. It all starts in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. He, he's feeling overwhelmed. And I want to sort of airlift right into this. Uh, Matthew 26, 38. These are the words of Jesus Christ. He says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. He's gathered his three closest friends together because he knows he's about to be taxed physically. He's about to be stretched to his limits emotionally. He's about to come to a breaking point spiritually. And he knows what's coming. He knows it's going to be tough. And so he gathers his friends and he says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. This is Jesus talking. This is not an overreactor talking. This is not the drama queen two cubicles away talking. This is not a hypochondriac talking. This is not your mother-in-law talking. This is Jesus talking. Jesus gets his friends together. How bad of a condition would you need to be in to get the three people closest to you and go, guys, I feel like I'm gonna die. My soul is crushed with grief, he says, to the point of death. I feel like I can taste death. You can feel his anxiety. The the author of Luke says, uh, the writer Luke, he says that uh, Jesus began to physically perspire. He was dripping sweat. It said it was like drops of blood, another metaphor. And essentially he was saying he was sweating bullets. And and so Jesus is feeling it. And he says to his friends, I just need you to hang out with me. I I can't circumvent this process. I've got to go right through it, but I'm I'm freaking out. And I need my friends here with me. And his friends are like, yeah, dude, we got you, bro. We got you. And they fall asleep. They fall asleep. And Jesus wakes them up. Hey, what part of my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death did you not understand? Point of death. That wasn't hyperbole. I feel like I'm tasting it. Would you help me out? And they're like, yeah, yeah, dude. No, our bad, our bad. And they fall asleep three times, which wakes them up. And so, so it's important that we see this because you have to understand, like, if your soul has ever been crushed with grief to the point of death, if you've ever felt that sort of thing, Jesus has felt the same thing. You're in good company. And so from Jesus' life, we learn, and especially on his trip to the cross, we learn three things that really help us get an honest, clear look at what it takes to find victory. Okay, and to live in victory. And I'm going to give you those three things. Here we go. The first thing is Jesus had clarity of vision. Jesus had a clear vision. By clear vision, I mean he stayed aware of the big picture. He, he kept his eyes on his purpose. And, and this is just an important thing to discipline yourself within your life to understand that as a human being, you're always going to have things in your life that are right in your face And they're going to feel bigger than they are. They're going to feel bigger than the big picture because they're right there. We know how optics work for a human being. If you're right in front of me, you're huge. You're massive. If somebody twice as big as you is 100 yards away, they look small. They're they're only that big because of my optics. But what's right in front of me feels so big. And so what you have to understand, like if you're going through something that's difficult and it feels big and it feels like it's crushing you and, and you're coming to your pain threshold, in that moment, we have a tendency as human beings to get so caught up in the here and now and so caught up into what's in my face right now that we can become short-sighted, that we can become overwhelmed. And Jesus dealt with the same thing in his humanity. And so it says in Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, for the vision set before him, for the purpose set before him, for the big picture. He kept his eye on the big picture, and so he was willing to endure everything he had to do instead of getting caught up in what was in his face right now. He was able to lift himself up. And I gotta tell you, like, you're gonna go through life, you're maybe going through something right now, it just feels massive because it's in your face. And you have to develop the discipline just like Jesus did to for the joy set before. You you gotta go up to 10,000 feet and look around. You gotta remember how far you've come. You gotta look at where you're headed, what's most important, what you've committed to finish, what you're doing in your life. And, And sometimes it gives you your bearings. It gives you correct perspective. Otherwise, the here and now can overwhelm me and make me short sighted. For the joy set before, 
He endured the cross. Well, one of the interesting things about Jesus and his ability to focus, it, it says uh, in, as he's going to the cross, at some very key moments, Jesus goes silent. It says he uttered not a word. In fact, uh, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 7, it says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. In Matthew 27, 12, Jesus is standing trial, and it says when the le leading priests and elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Jesus remained silent. Why? Why? Right? It begs the question, why? Jesus is standing up in court. He's given an opportunity to defend himself, and he doesn't say anything. Why was he so quiet? Well, it could be a few things. One, Maybe he was quiet because when you're quiet, you allow people to remember the thing you've already said. You know, I, don't, I shouldn't have to repeat myself 45 times. I said something. If I be quiet, then you think about what I said. So Jesus had already said some things. Uh, maybe the second reason is Jesus knew that going to the cross and being sentenced to die was part of his mission. So he's going to go ahead and let it happen. I'm going to go ahead and walk, walk in what I've been called to do. And so he didn't say anything. But maybe the third reason is because going quiet is what you do when you're really focused. Have you ever been hyper-focused on something and somebody called your name like four or five times you didn't know? You were just, you were just locked in on what you were doing until they finally started yelling at you? Greg! It's like, what? 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 Like, Greg, I called your name seven times. I'm like, I don't know, I was focused. I was locked in on what I was doing. And so Jesus, especially as things became really, really difficult, he went more and more quiet because he was locked in, he was focused. All throughout Jesus' life, even before he went to the cross, people were trying to get him into sideways energy, trying to bait him into some debate he didn't, he didn't want to have. His own brothers, by the way, in the book of John, his own brothers tried to get him into a, a sideways mission to pursue a distraction. They said, oh, Jesus, you're so talented, you're so good. Why are you hiding out here? You ought to go to the big city and become famous. And Jesus is like, that's not my mission. If you guys want to do it, you go to the big city and become famous. That's not what I'm here to do. What did he do? He understood his purpose. He understood his big picture. So he knew the difference between a temptation, a distraction, and a God-given opportunity, and he stayed locked in to his purpose. And friend, I tell you, when you keep eyes on the big picture, it keeps you from being petty. You don't have to chase down every rumor. You don't have to try to win over every hater. You don't have to respond to everything. You don't have to pursue everything that pops up, everything that glitters in gold, every shiny object. You don't have to go possess it. You know what is most important and, and, and it's for that joy set before, for the vision, the purpose, the big picture that you endure what is difficult. If you're gonna find victory in your life, you're gonna live consistently in victory. You're gonna live a big life. You're gonna to have to stay focused on the vision, have a clear picture. The, the second thing we learned from Jesus is he found victory by maintaining cleanliness of heart. He had a clear vision, he had a clean heart. You know, I, I think I pretty much talk about this every year. I, I don't plan to, but it just comes up because it, it's, it's one of the most powerful parts of Jesus' journey to the cross is Luke 23, 34, where he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His real-time forgiveness. It's convicting. It's convicting. I'm not good at that. Uh, I, I usually like to take a little bit of time before I forgive. But, but Jesus understood human dynamics. Again, let's not deify him to the point we forget about his humanity. Jesus understood what it meant to be human. He understood what flesh does. And what flesh does, flesh has a major tendency to become bitter when it's mistreated. That's what happens. And Jesus just knew. He knew flesh. He knew that, that the, every second you allow to tick in your unforgiveness causes bitterness to circle up around your heart. And so Jesus knew, not only do I need to forgive them for them, I need to forgive them for me. And so the velocity of his forgiveness was real time. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing because he didn't want to become bitter. Bitterness creates energy, by the way. If you allow your heart to become bitter at the mistreatment that you go through in life, for the injustices that happen in your life, the difficulties in your life that will inevitably come, if you allow bitterness to circle around your heart, what you'll do is you'll win a battle and lose a war. Because bitterness can provoke you. Bitterness can drive you to get even. And they hit low and I'm going to hit lower. And, and I'm going I'm to prove it. I'm, I'm living with something to prove. And I'm going mm, to make it happen. And, so, and you allow that energy to form up around your heart. And you end up with some semblance of a victory. 
It looks like a victory, but you can gain the whole world, friend, and you can lose your soul in the process. And Jesus knew, I not only have to get this victory, but I gotta, I gotta like who I am when I get there. I gotta be pure in heart when I get there. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Help me, Lord. Help me to forgive. Help me to, to maintain purity of heart. Make no mistake about it. I know how difficult this word is. This is a lot easier to preach about and shout about and sing about than it is to actually live it. When, when you're going through tough things, it's hard to keep a clean heart, real hard. It's hard enough in peacetime. When there's no like major conflicts, it's hard enough to keep a clean heart. It, it's hard enough when you're dealing with this or that, but when you're dealing with this and that and that and that, when, when your either ors turn into both ands, have you, have you ever had this? When it rains, it pours, and it's like it's all hidden at once, it'd be tough enough to deal with this by itself. But when I'm dealing with a scarcity of resources and career uncertainty and sickness in the family and a personal failure and, 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 and it's piling up and I start going, I don't know how much more of this I can take. And somebody comes and throws another thing on you you know, I, I got to keep my heart clean in the process. Jesus teaches us how incredibly important it is. In fact, for Jesus gives us, the, in this trip to the cross, I mean, the, the oars turn into ands real quick for Jesus, right? We started in Gethsemane. Guys, my soul's crushed with grief to the point of death. Will you stay with me? And they disappoint him. But that was just the beginning. That was the beginning. That would be bad enough to, to be pretty ticked off about. But, but there was more where that came from. He went from there and his friend Judas actively betrayed him. Uh, his friend Peter denies him at a, a really critical juncture of his journey when he really needed someone to support him and he denies even knowing him. Um, he had to deal with an unjust judicial system. Jesus stood up in court and Pilate, who was the governor or the, essentially the judge, said, oh, but this guy's innocent. Everybody knows he's innocent. He's totally innocent. In fact, he goes, oh, I, I wash my hands of this. But what did he do? He gave Jesus to the people because the people were crying out for Jesus' blood. And so he sentences him to die. He sends him to, to, to die, even though he knew, he knew Jesus was innocent because it would benefit Pilate politically. So he dealt with an unjust judicial system. He was beaten within an inch of his life, you know, with, with a whip with metal tips. And, and, and then he starts to bleed out. He's trying to carry his cross. He deals with physical failure. His, he can't even do the thing he needs to do. He has to have somebody carry his cross. Um, he's put in a category he doesn't belong in. He's hung between two criminals. He not only not committed a crime, he hadn't committed a sin. And yet here he is in public display, put in the middle of this. He had to deal with the volatility of public opinion. One week, the crowd's chanting, Hosanna, and they're putting down the red carpet for him to come into Jerusalem. And then next week, they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Get, give, us, give us a criminal, take him, kill him, put him to death. Jesus had to deal with the mood swings of the crowds. Uh, Jesus had to deal with the shame of being stripped naked and vulnerable and embarrassed. He, he had to deal with maybe the worst part of it, which he had to watch his mother watch him crucified. That's a certain kind of miserable. It's bad enough to go through it yourself, but when your mother is at the foot of the cross and you're totally exposed and, and, and you're, you're, you're in all of this shame, and yet all throughout Jesus said, Father, forgive them. If we go back to Hebrews 12, it says that, Jesus endured the cross, and then it says something interesting. It said he endured the cross disregarding its shame. Disregarding its shame. Here's what I know about shame. Shame doesn't disregard itself. It takes a wise person that understands what shame and what bitterness will do to your heart. And to say, if I'm actually going to live in victory, it's not just going to be because I have a compilation of trophies. I have a big trophy case, or I've got a photo op at the top of the podium. It's going to be that I had a clean heart along the way. And Jesus made a point to, to have a clean heart every step of the way. So how do we live in victory? It's clarity of vision. It's cleanliness of heart. And it's a commitment to finish. Number three is commit to finish. One of the big things in life is you're facing races or challenges or obstacles or battles is really understanding the difference between the battle you should quit fighting and the battle you should keep fighting. Because you don't fight every battle forever. You don't, not every relationship is till death do us part. There are some times you gotta cut some stuff off. You gotta cut some people off. 
You got to reframe and you got to reposition. And sometimes you got to remove people out of your life, but you got to finish, finish. We don't finish well. We start good, but we don't finish well. We got way more starters than finishers in the world these days. I know it's a little bit old school, but you need to be a finisher. Like you got to finish stuff. If the relationship needs to be cut off, finish it. We don't finish. We ghost. Didn't get many amens on that one, but uh, <laughs> we, we, we go dark. We disappear. Instead of sitting down eyeball to eyeball with somebody we started something with and say, let's bring it to a close. I'm going to finish it. We don't finish stuff. We trade a car in before we paid it off. We, we, we done with the job. We drop the stuff right there and walk off the job site. Listen, finish everything right. D dust the doggone baseboards on your way out. I don't care if they fired you. Finish. Finish everything well. Finish. Maybe Jesus' most famous words on the cross, it is finished. He finished. He's a finisher. We got to commit to finish. How many people don't get to the victory because they quit too early? They didn't finish. You got to know the thing that you finish, that you got to stop. And then you got to understand that like, even if I cut it off or, make, or quit on it, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to take it all the way through. Don't bring anything in your life you're not willing to finish. Finish it. Finish it. You know, my, 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 my dad, when I was 12 years old, he says, son, you're 12. It's time for you to join the workforce. I'm like, I'm like, dad, you know, I think they're child labor laws. He's like, I don't care about that. You know, it doesn't bother me one bit. You're a child. You're basically a man. You're 12 years old. You, I said, you got three hairs on your upper lip. It's time for you to get to work. I'm like, dad, I think that's illegal. He's like, oh, not in my house. It's perfectly legal. So, so we went around the neighborhood. No joke. My dad went and knocked doors with me. We push the mower around the neighborhood. And my dad said, hey, this is my son, Greg. You know, he, he, he loves this community. He loves Jesus. And he'd love to mow your lawn for $10, $10. People are like, that's a pretty good deal. 10 bucks. Yeah. Oh yeah. He'll do an amazing job. I promise you now, if he puts the Ford name on it, it's going to be outstanding. He'd love to do it. $10. People are like, I'll take that deal right now. All right. $10. So I end up mowing the neighborhood. My, my, my dad teaches me, he takes me out. He said, okay, here's what we do now. We start with the weed eater. What do y'all know about the weed eater? He said, we start by edging and we edge everything. Okay. You edge the front yard. We don't just edge the front yard. We edge the backyard. So we go in the backyard, you go all around the fence. Uh, we go in the back where they've, they've got a shed and you, you're going to edge around the back of the shed. The back, I'm like, dad, nobody can see the back of the shed. He said, God is omnipresent. He can see absolutely everything. Everything we do is an act of worship to God. You're going to edge the back of the shed. We're Fords. We do that. And then you're going to mow it. And then at the end, you're going to blow every single grass clipping off the sidewalk. You're not finished with the job until you blow the grass clippings off the sidewalk. If there's any grass clippings, we just know it's not done. We got to finish it. And so I'm like, okay, Dad, all right, whatever, man. You know, and so I go do my lawn mowing and stuff and get my $10. But, but how many of you have one of those parents that would check your work? You know what I'm talking about? Had no problem holding you accountable. Had no problem making sure you followed up on the instructions. And so my, my dad would go and he would check up on my work. And, 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 you know, God forbid that I left a few grass clippings on the sidewalk and he would track me down. And I'm down in the basement playing a little bit of Super Mario, brother. I'm playing a little Tech Mobile. I'm playing a little Mike Tyson's Punch Out. And my dad didn't mind too much that I was in the middle of a fight with King Hippo. My, my, finished, my work wasn't finished. So you're going to need to, you're going to need to pause that. We're going to take a walk. And he'd take me over to the sidewalk. He'd say, look at this, look at this. Everybody in the neighborhood now thinks that Fords think it's cool to leave grass clippings on the sidewalk. I gave you that name. You're not done. We don't play anything. We don't do anything till we finish, till we finish the job. And I know it's old school. I know it's old school, but I'm thankful for a, for a father that forced me to learn how to finish. When I was 12, I didn't thank him at all. When I was 12, I, I didn't say, you know, dad, you're really shaping my character here, you know? I just think it's gonna come back to bless me. You know, Dad, I think someday I may be in a marriage and it's real difficult and I'm gonna wanna cut bait and run, but I think learning how to finish here, you know, I think it's gonna make me a better father. Dad, one day I think I'm gonna be in the middle of a really important assignment that I brought into my life, a responsibility that I took on, and everything in me is gonna wanna just leave the grass clippings on the sidewalk. Thank you for helping me go. But I thank God for a father that said, we don't move on till we're done with the thing we took on. And you have a responsibility. If you've taken on a, an important role or a responsibility, you brought something in your life, 
finish it. Take it all the way through to the finish. It is finished, Jesus said. He's a finisher. I, I was, uh, recently I got in the mail, I, I got this box. Somebody sent me this box. It's from a person I didn't know at the time. And uh, I opened up the box and inside this box was a, a letter. On the front of the letter, it shared the uh, story of this man, his life, and uh, started at age eight when somebody did something to him in a basement that should have never happened. He was alone, he was exposed, and somebody took advantage of him. And now he's in his 50s, and he's still fighting, he's battling. And within the story, he says at the bottom, he said, you know, you're probably wondering what, what's up with the rock. And on the back, he talks about a defining moment in his life where he got to a low place and, and he ultimately, it was in the, that low place and even through his pain and his trauma that he came into relationship with Jesus. And he was honest in his journey. I, I reached out to him and we met up face to face and he shared with me that the, the rock represented to him that God was with him in the journey, but the reality is he's had to continue to fight. He said, you know, there are times I get really angry because I'm like, you know, I'm in my 50s. I'm still dealing with this thing from when I was eight. But he was honest about it. You know, sometimes in church we're not honest. You know, we go, oh, yeah, I came to church, and it's all sort of happily ever after type stuff. You know, it's like, I came to church, man, and the band played this really great song, and the preacher was on it, and, and the Holy Spirit zapped me, and I walked out, and I never had to deal again. And yet he said, no, you know, I've, even as we were talking that day, you could feel his emotions even swinging all those decades later. And yet in the moment, he airlifted himself in the middle of the conversation, and he started to gain perspective. He, he went back to the clear vision, and he said, you know, he goes, man, I, I've come so far. Like this rock represents a battle. It's not worth much to other people. It's just something people leave on the ground. He said, but to me, this is my battle that I fight and I continue to fight and that, that, that God is helping me to finish. And he said, but I'm, I'm in it and I'm continuing to fight. I've come a long, long way. I'm not where I was last year. I'm not where I was 10 years ago. I'm in a new place, but I'm still battling and fighting. And, and Friend, I got to say to you, like, you have to understand that a big part of your battle, a big part of your fight is an ongoing fight. And oftentimes when it starts to hit a fever pitch, when things become the most intense, often you're right at the verge of a victory. You're right there. You know, it's interesting when you look both Old Testament and New Testament, you'll see that there's a principle that oftentimes the greatest attack happens right before or right after a great victory. It's right around a victory when things get really difficult. It's right around a breakthrough when everything gets difficult. I'm not talking about victory like, 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 like I win the battle and I never have to fight it again. I'm talking about a breakthrough into a new place. You see this happen all the time. You go Old Testament, King David. King David defeats the Ammonites in this huge victory. The next chapter, he has an attack in his flesh and he finds himself tempted. He gives into a temptation, makes his worst moral decision of his life right after a great victory. The prophet Elijah, Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal and in the next chapter he plummets into deep, deep, deep depression right after he just wins. Oh, you see Jonah, remember Jonah? Jonah and the whale, Jonah and the big fish. Jonah goes to Nineveh on assignment from God, proclaims the word of the Lord. 120,000 people are rescued. 120,000 plus people are saved. And yet in the next chapter he's having suicidal thoughts attack his mind. He's starting to proclaim and declare, I wish I wasn't alive coming out of his mouth. It's often right before, right after a great victory. And friend, this is what happens. People who are right on the doorstep of victory quit. They quit. You have to know the difference between the thing you need to quit and the thing you need to keep fighting. Because if this is something God has you to keep fighting, you got to fight to the finish. you got to stay in it. And oftentimes it's when, when you're hitting your pain threshold that you're right on the verge of a victory. And when you understand this principle, it shifts your whole mood. Because normally in my flesh, I get suckered into discouragement when things go from either or to both and. When it's this and this and this and this and this and this, my flesh starts to go, I can't take it anymore, I'm out, I'm done, I'm finished. 
I, I, I just want to be done. My, my flesh gets really weak. But when I understand that it's often when the thing heats up, when your body's given out, the, the fickle crowd's all over the place, uh, you've been beaten in a sense, you've been put in a category you didn't belong in, you're dealing with injustice, everything you're dealing with, and you start to realize, oh, no, 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 I'm getting closer to victory. Now, instead of throwing in the towel, you start rolling up your sleeves. You're like, oh, no. Now, I almost quit. I almost quit, but it, it just won too many ands. You brought this next day. Oh, I'm in now. Now I'm in. Now I'm in. Now, now I'm sticking in. I'm not going anywhere now. I know we're right there. I know we're right there. And, and so what happens is the, the attack backfires. Instead of taking you down, instead, instead of making you, you get weak and, and quit, it just makes you more stubborn. It makes you more locked in. I'm not going anywhere. We're right on the verge of a victory. Romans or Hebrews 12, one and two, let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. I think I like it better in the King James. In the King James, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, the finisher of our faith. Finisher, finisher, he's a finisher. You're a finisher. If you're in the right fight, quitting's not an option. You stay locked in. You say, I'm not, I'm not gonna quit right before the victory. I'm not gonna stop. I'm not gonna stop even though I don't feel like it. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna get clarity of vision. <laughs> I'm not gonna get so hung up in this present trouble, I lose my bearings. I need to think about where God's brought me from, where I am now, and where I'm headed to, and I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep my heart clean along the way. Everything in my flesh wants to get bitter. Everything in my flesh wants to turn into a pessimist. Everything in my flesh wants to lash out. But I'm gonna ask, the Lord created me a clean heart. Forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Fight for a clean heart and commit to finish. He's the author and the finisher. And I'll tell you this, you're gonna have long nights. If you think living in victory means you always get a full night of sleep, means you never have a tough day, you don't understand what it means to live in victory. You will have long nights, you will have tough days, but if you'll fix your eyes on Jesus, he will not only author your faith, he'll finish your faith. So you keep your heart clean, you keep your eyes clear, you commit to finish, and he will see you through.